Hello and welcome to another fantastic interview with a top brain health expert. Today we talked to Dr. Leslie Sherlin about neurogenesis. Dr. Leslie Sherlin is the CSO, the Chief Science Officer of Sense Labs. He's the co-creator of Versus Brain Training Software, and he is the best possible person to have this talk with. We discuss in particular this article um, about neurogenesis, what it means to you and I. Uh, if you have somebody in your family with Alzheimer's, um, dementia, if you, have, if you know anyone that has had a stroke, or if you suffer from stress, this is an interview that you don't want to miss. So I'll go ahead and get into it without further ado. Here's Dr. Leslie Sherlin. All right. Uh, welcome back, Dr. Sherlin. I uh, gave a little bit of an intro to our talk today, um, to talk about neurogenesis as the basis for brain plasticity and how it relates to some of the stuff that you're doing over there um, at, the, uh, at the clinic. Um, so uh, we want to reference some of the stuff that's uh, pointed out in this article. Um, so I'll start out by kind of um, talking about just a quick segment, quoting a quick segment out of the article, and then um, asking specifically your experience um, how it relates to that specific uh, segment. Um, so we'll start out here. Um, a quote uh, from the article uh, reads that research in 2008 showed that stem cells in the hippocampus survive better and flourish in correlation to increased mental effort and when greater numbers of stem cells mature, they produce higher levels of serotonin that then lead to positive moods and joyful emotions. Uh, the section goes on to say that brain exercises that produce more stem cells also slow both onset and progression of degenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and dementia. Uh, one researcher has proposed that challenging brain exercises also elevate mood better than pharmaceutical drugs. Um, so the question to you, I mean, I, I know personally that, um, um, you know, I've dealt with this in my everyday life, but I wanted to ask from your experience with high level athletes and um, uh, people in, in very high stressful situations, um, in all the years you've been using neurofeedback and the clients you've helped with brain training, do you notice their dispositions outside of competition in everyday life changing as a result of the training process? Yeah, so maybe, um, you know, their disposition in a general way, the answer is, is yes. Um, you know, we certainly see people who have a, a bit more calm or poise, a bit more presence about them than you might uh, have experienced before, but it's, it's more about a personal awareness and the attitude that they bring in more than, uh, you know, some characteristics or traits around their personality attributes. So. Certainly, we see a shift, and in, in, in they uh, many times. In fact, it's the family members and those individuals who are around uh, the client who start to notice these things first and point it out to them because it's an, an internal thing. It's a reflection that we're maybe not aware of uh, until others point it out to us. But, but absolutely, just a just a more calm demeanor and uh, you know, and in, uh, poise is the word I like to use because it's that ability to control ourselves with some intent. It's kind of the definition that um, I like to see people, you know, carrying that confidence about, you know, with purpose and intent, acting and carrying themselves. Okay, and then any relation to um, overall mood and just general general happiness, uh, I guess that goes kind of hand in hand, I guess. Right, absolutely. Perfect, okay. Um, so, um, question two, uh, what is a good description of um, transcranial direct current stimulation and um, I'll pop a, an image of that up it's referenced in the article which I can uh, I'm sure you're aware of but if you want to kind of give um, the high level what that technology is and how it correlates or relates or is different from what you do right. with neurofeedback yeah, so it's, uh, it's it's largely different um, it's similar because they're both uh, interacting in the electrical processes of a neuron where uh, transcranial direct current stimulation, just as the, the name implies, in fact, a current, a, a constant current that is applied uh, to the scalp, and you have a current flowing. So you're applying this direct current, and it will go through an anode, and then the current passes through the brain and through the skull, and uh, then comes to the, to the cathode. And so there is, as the neuron begins to fire, uh, 
uh, doing its natural firing. So it's not a stimulation technique in where it causes the neuron to fire, but when it does, it just causes a larger reaction or a larger response to its already firing uh, process. And so there's some early research that has been around quite a long time, in fact, um, but more recently been applied uh, in cognitive enhancement and those types of applications, you know, executive functions, attention, mood regulation, uh, these types of things. So it's different in the, uh, in the way that it is applying a current uh, where neurofeedback is uh, re-encouraging or it's encouraging or feeding back, giving rewards when the brain creates a particular electrical signature. So one is based on a learning theory. Uh, when you do the right thing, I'm going to give you a reward. You're going to learn what that's like, and you're going to recreate it, where uh, the, the direct current stimulation is there's not a learning process involved. Uh, the brain is being stimulated to produce and reinforce a particular current or a particular ac action from that neuron. Got it. So there are similar applications in performance and cognitive enhancement in a general way. Uh, there's certainly the idea, they, they both relate to neurogenesis and the application of neuroplasticity and growth and uh, enhancing the faculties that we already have, but, but quite different principles underneath. Gotcha. No, I was just curious personally about that. Um, um, so um, <laughs> let's just reference, um, if we can, a, um, a situation where neurofeedback and brain stimulation, brain training in general, um, can help regenerate the brain after after a um, tragedy like uh, neurodegenerative disease, um, trauma, car accident, brain hemorrhage, stroke, something like that. Um, neurofeedback uh, it plays a big role. I know it's, it's something you know it's, it's possible, and, and we do have some. Things that we've done in the past with neurofeedback to help bring bring stroke victims and, and uh, Alzheimer's patients uh, back to reality and, and uh, retrain the brain. So, um, uh, what techniques are necessary um, to re uh, regain sorry the lost function of the brain when it relates to neurofeedback? And is there any specific technique that you use to to bring back um, someone that's um, suffering from damage versus someone like an athlete? In fact, there's a, a, quite a bit of difference in the application, the process, or the underlying principles are the same. So it's still about uh, getting a particular set of neurons to fire synchronously, and then when they do it, you reward them for doing it. In, a, in an athlete or a performance scenario, it's really about um, learning flexibility between different cognitive states and emotional states and, and how they can reproduce those at the right moment. Uh, where in this kind of a scenario where there's been an injury or there's damage uh, from whatever the cause, it's a bit of a different strategy. So now you're looking at areas that potentially have um, either died or are uh, weakened in some degree. And so now you're really looking at enhancement from a rehabilitative type standpoint. Uh, so you're talking about increasing um, the number of uh, synapses or dendritic connections really just emphasizing and building stronger neurons and networks after uh, some, some damage has occurred. So it's a, it's a different application because now we're very focal in where the training occurs. So we're more specific to that site uh, where they may have had the, um, the damage. And um, we're typically doing a different, we're rewarding different attributes of that electrical signature. So in in performance models, we're training lots of different aspects. So we're asking them sometimes to be more engaged, sometimes to be lesser engaged, and somewhere in between at other times where in the uh, rehabilitative type of process, we're really trying to get those areas online. We're, we're potentially also doing a lot more of what we call generally uh, connectivity training, where we're really trying to get those areas or those structures to be to reach out uh, from a figurative standpoint, to reach out and become more connected or more uh, ingrained with those areas that are having to support it uh, and also trying to minimize the impact of other structures taking over those functions so if uh, the, the brain is always looking for the path of least resistance so if one area is damaged and another surrounding areas can take over that role and function um, then they will and that becomes maybe less efficient but it's effective and so if it is effective then we um, the brain 
just it may not produce or, or put the necessary effort towards rehabilitation on the damaged area because that function is being served elsewhere. A little analogy I like to use is um, <clears throat> what around a construction site. So it's the most efficient way for us to get uh, over across distances by taking our interstate system where if there's construction it might be uh, more uh, might be more time consuming than usual but overall it saves us time than dealing with the construction to take surface streets and so we have to go through stop signs and red lights and those types of things if we do that for a period of time long enough we, that just becomes ingrained as our natural route to get to where we're going and we may not jump back onto that interstate system and so what we want to do is encourage um, the brain to continue to try that interstate system, and, you know, as you know, provide the proper resources, you know, blood flow, oxygen, all those types of things, so that uh, we don't give up on the area that has been damaged. Or, or if the interstate gets um, removed entirely, civilization will just uh, create everything they need on that side of the interstate. That's right? exactly so, right. Right. Yeah, I think in the article actually it's referencing a um, situation. Um, a woman was born without a right hemisphere. Right. The left hemisphere created a, you know, everything that it needed to survive without the right hemisphere to live through. That's basically. right. Um, that yeah, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, and that, and that really leads into the, the whole conversation then. I mean, it's a complicated thing around injury and degenerative diseases because it depends on the severity, it depends on the etiology. In the absence of you know having a particular lobotomy or having some area or some tissue removed, clearly is a very different scenario where we're trying to augment and enhance uh, the efficiency of remaining uh, cells instead of trying to rehabilitate. So uh, it, it, it's a very um, uh, complex picture for people, but much of the type of process is very similar. Um, and, and that actually kind of leads me into just a follow-up question quick on that subject. Um, um, is there an age limit that you found or that other research suggests for any type of um, rehabilitation of the brain, or is it still left to be determined? Yeah, I think um, well, there certainly hasn't been, there isn't a limit where you're over X age, you might as well just forget about it, <laughs> you're not coming. Um, but we but we also know that the younger we are, the more likely we are. I mean, we're having, uh, you know, more production of, of cells, and, um, you know, neurogenesis is a much faster rate, although slow, it's at a much faster rate the younger we are. So. Um, age is a factor, but I don't think that we should give up on anybody at any particular age because the evidence suggests even at, uh, at an age, at an, in the elder population, there is still this process occurring. So uh, certainly we've seen it in some of our clients um, who've been, you know, had dementia or mild cognitive impairments, even some with Alzheimer's. Uh, there's some progress to be made, if nothing else, than reducing the rate or speed at which degeneration occurs. Um, makes perfect sense. Like the rest of our bodies, it heals faster the younger we are. Um, okay, so um, let's talk about stress um, real quick. Um, chronic levels of stress, I'm reading a quote from the article, uh, chronic levels of stress increases baseline levels of cortisol, which decreases the production of stem cells and then therefore depresses the mood. Um, at high levels, the cortisol <coughs> produced by long-term stress decreases neurogenesis and even shows up on an MRI looking like Alzheimer's disease, aka uh, shrunken cerebral cortex. Um, I know I get anxiety and stress when I feel as though I'm unable to um, solve an everyday problem, whether it's at work um, or relationships, and um, these are you know, small challenges compared to what our, our athletes and top performers, CEOs, etc. Et um, deal with on an everyday basis. Um, so the question to you would be, um, do you have any case studies uh, you'd like to reference from your clinic um, where you can attribute a decrease in neurogenesis from the constant stress on your athletes and clients' brains after, after years of competition or tough decision making? Yeah, so that's um, it's a bit of a tricky question. It's a, it's a very good and relevant question. Um, but as most of the healthy individuals who come in that I get to encounter, we're not doing a lot of um, heavy structural imaging and those types of things. So we would be, uh, it's uncertain how much or to what degree there's a structural impact uh, from all of these high stressors across time. We're much more aware of 
uh, different uh, emotional types of aspects and the cognitive aspects that you mentioned. And we certainly see that reflected in the electrical activity of the brain and the way that uh, it's, it's much less invasive and a much more cost-effective way of imaging. Uh, and so we, that's the, the modality that we use for imaging. We do certainly see that individuals who have a uh, higher level of chronic uh, stress or anxiety do have diminishing capacities or the capacity for performing everyday types of functions, and, uh, just as you alluded to. Some of that is, um, you know, on, a, on an acute basis, is just simply we're, we're processing that information. So whatever the stressors or the stimuli are, we're heavily involved in allocating our resources to managing that. And so there's less, uh, less availability, less attention span, so to speak, or focus ability for that particular aspect. But on a chronic uh, or long-term exposure, we start to see those patterns continue, even when the stressor is removed. And so there is this um, emotional and cognitive type of carryover uh, that even after the, the component's gone. So we have uh, lots of clinical patients who come in and they have a, what we might call burnout uh, syndrome or a chronic fatigue even uh, that, that comes on and now there's no immediate explanation for why they're experiencing uh, this, the, the chronic fatigue or the, um, perhaps even the, the physical pain that can, that can also go along with that. But it's just from uh, you know long-term exposure to stressors and high levels of cortisols, which are you know fatiguing the adrenal glands, uh, and finally they they have a collapse. And we see this a lot from high performers uh, because they are constantly pushing themselves at that edge. Uh, then when finally the system gives out, <laughs> the system has given out, and so we've seen both on. Um, you know, it reminds me also of. Uh, a different population that have uh, very high levels of exposure. We get to evaluate uh, some groups of soldiers and those who have been exposed to combat uh, stressors perform at a, um, over a longer period of time, perform at a lesser level from cognitive uh, strategies, on cognitive strategies. So there's some residual that occurs and so that the training can help modulate and uh, even providing the system, the physical system, lots of support is necessary for a long period. So it's it can be quite um, detrimental to performance uh, for uh, even for those who are the highest performers after having chronic exposure. Okay. Um, yeah. So it's safe to say um, that neurogenesis does decrease uh, after chronic levels of stress ensue, and cortisol is, is kind of at a constant state. Neurogenesis. Right. Yeah, it's, it's very much that same uh, as we start to think about, you know, the state, uh, the stress response where we're constantly, if we are in that fight or flight moment, um, it's not about, it, it's about self-preservation in the moment. And so those other types of processes take a back seat. And, and that's one, you know, one of the consequences even is the neurogenesis. And in fact, there could be quite a refractory period that has to occur before we start to see things normalize. Um, almost done here. Two more questions, and we'll wrap up. Um, um, so you, you touched on this. Um, I think you actually did answer this, but the second question I had, and follow up to that, was um, what part does brain training play in the prevention of a drop off in neurogenesis um, and diseases like Alzheimer's and dementia? I know um, it's not a huge part of the clinic's um, work right now. You guys are more focused on the um, high level athletes and performer, mm -hmm. but Obviously, brain training can play a big role in um, the prevention of Alzheimer's and dementia, but um, um, kind of trying to bring obviously those those brains back into play, like you mentioned earlier. So, um, if you could touch on the role that brain training plays in the prevention of the drop off yeah. in neurogenesis. Absolutely. So, what we know is certainly that um, you know the etiology and that the the degeneration occurs at, at some rate and for differing individuals that rate varies and so we uh, what we do know is that keeping a high level of engagement uh, from a neuronal type of activity so more than just doing crossword puzzles but in fact what that does for our brain is the important piece around that neuronal firing and keeping them active if not warding off or slowing the actual development of degeneration, increasing the neurogenesis component so that 
what we see is a, a longer onset, uh, a longer uh, time period from diagnoses to each of the stages of symptomatology. So that uh, what that ultimately means to you know the client is that they're going to be able to increase the uh, their overall cognitive function and minimize the negative impact to quality of life by keeping uh, the brain in a healthier state. And so it's uh, just like with any other type of degenerative uh, disorder that we might imagine from a physical standpoint from the neck down, you know, keeping our body healthy and muscles strong and bones, uh, you know, fortified is going to slow down that progression and increase the, you know, the overall quality uh, as we fight off these, uh, these symptoms. Okay, so um, training the brain to be able to combat stressors and deal with stress factors right. leads to the blocking of that potential destruction of neurogenesis by the release of constant cortisol, constant stress, which uh, would lead to, obviously, uh, inevitably, possible disease and onset yeah. of Alzheimer's and dementia because the neurogenesis is blocked by those stressors. So you need to be able to train the brain to um, you know, combat those stressors, block them, so you can keep, keep the brain healthy and, and, and happy and uh, prevent Alzheimer's and dementia. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's this model. It's an old one, but it's a good one uh, that still certainly has some relevance. You know, the diathesis stress model, which basically is that you know, we have some predisposition or some occurrence of a, of a disease or pathology that is, um, you know, we're predisposed for that, but it's not until it reaches a certain level that it actually has a negative impact on us. And so we see this from physical attributes as well as mental uh, aspects. We can do lots of neuroimaging and say someone, you know, they have the brain that looks like you know, depressed or inattentive, fill in the blank but they don't experience those symptoms. It's not until there's a significant level of stressor or impact that causes the symptoms to manifest. And then sometimes those symptoms, when they do, can be quite overwhelming. It comes as a rapid onset, we might even say. So, you know, this process of, of keeping our stressors managed, of keeping our brain healthy, engaged, um, you know, raises that threshold to which we might become a, a victim or succumb to, you know, the symptom presentation.